Why, Mother. Yes, Father. I thought I left you. Forty-five miles from here, back in Detroit. Well, what are you and Sister doing away out here at Milford? The same thing you are, rounding out our education. But I didn't think that you, uh, women, aren't interested in machinery. Oh, don't be old-fashioned. I use more machinery in my household every day than you do in your office. But I... I didn't get you any passes. Well, you probably couldn't have if you told the General Motors people that Sister and I aren't interested. I, uh... There, there, dear, it's all right. I managed to get the passes myself. You don't even know where we are. General Motors Proving Ground. Ah, oh, you read the sign. I'll bet you don't even know what a proving ground is. A place where they try out automobiles. For what? To see how good they are. Come, son. In a general way, the little lady has the right idea. You'll all understand about it better after you have gone through these gates. The place in there is just a huge laboratory, about a mile and one-half square, all fenced in, where General Motors engineers, Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac LaSalle, General Motors truck, and Fisher body may see for themselves what happens to cars in actual use on every conceivable kind of road and under every possible condition. The place here is just a big laboratory, he said. Just what did he mean by that? Yes, that's your question. And I hope I can answer it. You see, the proving ground really is a laboratory. It's a place with a lot of apparatus that the proving ground staff use for their own tests and which they also make available to the engineers of all General Motors car companies. Oh. Then you don't prove out every new General Motors automobile here. Yes, we do. While the work is still being designed, before the factories start making the new model. By the time it gets into factory production, it's been thoroughly proved out. Proving is ended. General Motors doesn't experiment on the public, you know. I was wondering why we didn't see a couple of million automobiles in the place. That's unnecessary. And it would be impractical. Don't you see? That would make every new automobile a used car. Well, of course. But why must the place be all fenced in? To keep out nosy people like you women. Oh, children. <laughs> it's more that the engineers may keep their work absolutely under control. Without anybody always telling them how to do it. If the engineers tried to make these tests out on the public roads, they'd never be able to do a thorough job. There would be too much interference. Traffic? Traffic regulations? unknown weather conditions, and all sorts of varying factors. So the only way the engineers can get an undivided chance to study them is to stage them privately, using these 23 miles of road that weave back and forth in these hills. Fascinating. See it for yourselves. Come on. This shop is one of several. There's one for each General Motors car company and Fisher body so their engineers can carry out any test they want on their own cars. But that, that doesn't look like a General Motors car. It isn't. You're apt to see many outside makes, both domestic and foreign, on the proving ground. You mean that the makers rent to... No, no. The cars are bought by General Motors and put over the hurdles just to see what competitors are giving their customers. By determining such values in all cars, General Motors evaluates its own position in the competitive field. Pretty smart. Now what's that fellow over there holding in his hand? That's something like a transit. As a matter of fact, it's a sort of an optical yardstick. You quickly measure a car. That's what happens when a car comes in. It's measured from top to bottom, inside and out. Tape measures, rules, calipers, wheelbase to cigar lighter. Gee, they don't miss a thing, do they? No, they don't. Is this always the first test? No, they may begin anywhere, depending on what they're trying to find out. In this case, they're establishing first what the car will do on the level and in a straight line. Now, let's watch the acceleration, or what most people call pickup. Doesn't seem like much here, but pickup is mighty important, especially when you find yourself facing a traffic light hemmed in on either side by other cars. How can they measure acceleration? Why, they have a printing chronograph. 
operated by a photoelectric cell. This is an instrument which automatically records the time for each two and one half miles per hour change in speed. As the car increases in speed, the light beam shifts from one mirror to the next. This little beam of light through the photoelectric cell causes this machine to print the record. Along with acceleration or pickup in first, we also want to know what a car will do in second and high. But of course, the most spectacular demonstration in the speed range is how fast a car can go. in this direction won't be enough. He'll have to turn around and come back again. Why? On account of the wind. A speed test wouldn't be fair, either against the wind or with it. So he does it both ways. This is a west wind. That's all right for this straightaway. What do you do if the wind comes from the north? Nothing simpler. At that end, there's another straightaway at right angles to this one. Fellows who designed this place thought of everything. To make the test properly, surely you have to know also how fast the wind is blowing. You are perfectly right. And that is why General Motors built and equipped a modern weather bureau. See it? The Proving Ground Weather Bureau has become an official government cooperative station reporting weather conditions for this district. Hello. Eh? We're in luck. The next test I was going to tell you about is measuring miles per gallon. That's an item for the family pocketbook. I mean, the whole apparatus is right here under our noses. Come on. Hello. Come on, Ernie. Tell us all about it. Why, sure. You see, we first decide what speed we want to measure. Until we get up to that speed, the engine uses gasoline out of this container. Then we switch over to the other container, and we use out of that till we've covered the required distance. You see, son? Then all they have to do is read the figures on the scale from here to here. That's it. And by doing it several times over, we can strike a close average. Thanks, Ernie. I suppose you've seen this so many times that... No, no. It's only the man with an empty head who gets tired of studying these things. I was just thinking about the order of our tests. Now, we've seen cars start, come up to speed, and register their number of miles to the gallon. All that. Now I think it's time for us to see how a car once started is brought to a stop. Huh. These men are using the decelerometer. It tells exactly how fast a car slows to a standstill. In other words, how fast one can stand still. <laughs> There's a paradox for you. Now remember those brake experiments they were showing us at the General Motors Research Laboratory? Uh-huh. If I were a young mother with a baby carriage and a couple of small children by the hand, I could get right down on my knees and thank heaven for brakes as efficient as that. Far, we've looked at some of the tests on a car going in a straight line. Now let's look at two or three turning tests. Making turns means moving the wheel. Try turning it. Now, here's something for measuring steering effort. The pressure of the hand, the pull, and all that. 
That's the girl. There are several interesting ways of measuring the area of visibility, how much unobstructed view there is from the driver's seat, photographing it with a panoramic camera, or better, and here's something really new. By using a couple of lamps to represent the driver's eyes, the light from these lamps shines on everything your two eyes can see. Now that's clever. This is how they measure the turning radius. Gee, that's good. Don't I know the importance of that? With starting, stopping, running, turning, and all the other movements on the level out of the way, what's the next logical consideration? Up and down hill. Absolutely. Head of the class for you, my boy. Consequently, we have grades ranging all the way from just a gentle tilt to uh, this jumbo. Just how steep is this grade? 25%, one quarter of the way between dead level and straight up and down. Gosh! We have two more normal grades. One is 11 and 6 tenths percent and 1,400 feet long. And this one is 7 and 2 tenths percent and 2,900 feet long. What are those things in the road? Electrical contacts to register the time and position of a car climbing up. But we don't use that method anymore. How do you do it now? With a printing chronograph I told you about a while ago, when they were measuring acceleration. This bank carries a speeding car at an angle of 34 degrees. But where's the end of it? There is no end. It's a big loop. Well, then. How far is it from here to here? <laughs> the whole loop is three and eight tenths miles. On the grounds are other roads that go up and down hills, and around turns and over sections that represent every leading type of road to be found anywhere. There's Tarbia, that won early a favor when the automobile was coming into its own. Dirt roads, still to be found in undeveloped country and always better than no road at all. Gravel and sand that in wet places at least keep drier than dirt roads. There's water, tough test of body tightness, engine performance. And there's good old Belgian Bach with its fond recollections of the city streets. When the weatherman up there on the hill is willing, we also have extremes of temperature, rain and snow. But still not enough for the relentless engineers and all this grueling round that keeps up day and night week in, week out. Cars running over all kinds of roads are subjected to twisting strains. This machine twists the car so that we can see in slow motion what happens to the hood, doors, shock absorbers, springs, and many other parts of the car. The engineers have just finished their tests on this car. Poor thing. It looks tired. And no wonder. Did it go through all the tests we saw made this afternoon? Many more. Over ten times as many. Gee! And the information you get. What about that? That information is the real treasure of the proving ground. A case history of every automobile that has been honored with this attention. But the information? What's done with it? Taken with information that comes from the General Motors Research Laboratories, from the manufacturing divisions, from the car users of the world, and built in, built into the General Motors line of cars. Cars that fit every person's purpose, eliminating waste, lessening expense, improving quality, and increasing performance. 